I, I think we shouldn't miss <coughs> what, what I would call some of the revolutionary lessons of the Occupy movement. And also, uh, it pertains to Wisconsin. You know, and, and, and especially at a given time, this time being a time of, you know, increasing global crisis and, you know, the <coughs> radical consciousness of the Occupy movement is not an isolated phenomena. There are other sectors of our class that are also being radicalized. Maybe they've yet to move. It's hard to move in election year, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the point is this, you know, the dialectics of what happened this, this fall. Um, I'm a veteran here on this, uh, this yeah. probably one or two, well, we're all veterans, but I'm a little older. I, I was, <laughs> I was uh, recruited into communism as an anti-war GI, you know, during Vietnam War. Um, I can't tell you how many meetings I've sat at and how many attempts, and, and others can speak about it, to build coalitions around an issue, the war, jobs, uh, health care, whatever. Uh, can, did, did this union sign on? Uh, can we get uh, th these people who have resources? Will this foundation give us some money? Are we too red for them? You know, send somebody else, not me, because I'm too red. You know, and that's good work, and that has to be done. But that didn't happen this fall. See? I, I, my, my organization, Workers' Will Party, was also part of the uh, uh, Bloomberg Bill, which is a very good thing. You know. And you remember that one of the reasons why we did it down at City Hall is because we were trying to get the unions and the communities who we were hoping were angry about the budget. You know, they didn't show up. It was only token. That was another thing. Occupy Wall Street did not go and ask anybody's permission. They probably didn't know and didn't care, but I'll tell you what was going on. Had we gone to the labor leaders in New York City, with huge unions, and we're all with them, and said, let's occupy Wall Street. They would have said, are you crazy? You know, these leaders, and I'm not demonizing them, I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> They've been around operating the same way for so long that even in a crisis, even when everything is being taken away from them and their unions being decimated, they have psychologically accommodated themselves to the norms and rules that were made by the enemy. You don't occupy anything. You march, you have a rally, you go home on the subway. No problem. That's what they knew. And they told us, if you remember, it was an interesting thing. They told us when they, we had unity with them, the coalition that we had for a while, that you know, uh, Bloombergville came out of. Don't do anything. Some of the big demonstrations, don't you do anything. Now don't you get on Wall Street. Don't you, no arrests, no arrests. No direct actions, you see. Now Occupy, they didn't ask anybody. And they probably didn't care about unions. And some of them may have not understood it, may have been against it. But what they did, dialectically, was a catalyst that invigorated and excited and moved the whole labor movement. My point is that sometimes you got to do something to push the class forward. Because if you don't do it, those who have been used to sitting, who are in responsibilities of leadership in our class, will sit on the struggle. That's one of the things we learned. Just a, a final second about, you know, revolutionary organizations should be out recruiting. You'll have success. But I agree. There should also be some vertical organizing. There are those on the left will never agree, different orientation, you know. But those of us who have a revolutionary orientation, Time. we should be meeting each other and talking about vertical organization. That revolutionary unity will win some of these youth over. They'll see it as a big step forward.